Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So having given that testimony of, of escaping that fire on I-25 southbound this last Wednesday, uh, May 31st, and I knew that if we had been one minute earlier, we would have missed it. We would have been in front of it, past it, even 30 seconds, 30 seconds. If we had gotten 30 se- been there 30 seconds earlier, we would have been half a mile down the road and on the other side of that. And I kept thinking, why did we get stuck there? I mean, I'm not, you know, saying that there doesn't always have to be a why. I mean, you know, I'm not that analytical about stuff. But I was wondering in my heart, and you know what? I feel I heard from the Lord yesterday because I was asking the Lord that he needed somebody there who could command in the name of Jesus. Probably no believer, m- might have been all unbelievers there, but even if they was a Christian, few Christians know they have authority. Amen. Very few Christians know they have authority. And I kept thinking the whole time, if that fire had kept moving another 30 feet and engulfed the first car in flames. It could have exploded and it would have been a chain reaction all the way up the freeway, thousands of vehicles and perhaps thousands of lives. It could have been an astronomical catastrophe, bumper to bumper. Nobody can go anywhere. One car catches on fire, another car, another car. They start exploding and spreading the fire all the way up I-25. It could have been astronomical devastation. And God needed somebody there to command in the name of Jesus. And we were close enough to see it to know what was going on. Because if we had been half a mile back, everybody's like, what's going on? Hong Kong, you know, trying to look and see what's going on. Why is everybody stopped and you don't know what to command? We saw it. We were so close. We could see it maybe 50, 60 feet from it five or six car lengths, but the cars, three cars in front of us. We had to see it with our eyes and see that fire coming right at us and command in the name of Jesus. We command that fire to stop and go back. And the Holy Spirit prompted to me, I needed somebody there. I needed somebody there who could command in the name of Jesus, or this could have been an astronomical devastation. I thought, wow. Well, Lord, (laughs) use somebody else. (laughs) No, No, use us. (laughs) Glory to God. No, I take that back. I have said use me, so use me. (laughs) Oh, no. Amen, amen. So, I mean, God said he needed somebody there to command that fire to stop because it stopped the moment we commanded in the name of Jesus. It stopped moving toward us. And two or more agree, touching whatever they ask. They have what they ask. And so as we commanded in the name of Jesus, it stopped right there. And it did not progress. It was still burning, but it didn't progress any farther. It's like, wow. It's just like God put up that shield. Hallelujah. God needed somebody. So that's another reason why sometimes you're in a situation like, well, why am I here? God needs somebody there to speak the name of Jesus so that other people can be saved (laughs) and that an astronomical devastation can be avoided. (laughs) Amen. So hallelujah. That was just such an amazing, you know, um, awesome, wonderful um, seeing the word and the command and the authority. We let's go to Genesis one. Go to Genesis 1. The authority that we have. And I've told you before that this is probably my favorite verse in the Bible. Genesis 1, 26. It tells us how God, why God made man, how God made man, what he gave to man, what he told man to do. This is our entire purpose. And this is who we are. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move on the ground, the creeping things on the ground. And the Lord has shown me that when he said all the earth, he means the earth as a planet, not the kingdom of darkness. That's New Testament. 
That's where our authority comes in the New Testament over the kingdom of darkness. But here, he's talking about the planet Earth. He's talking about the physical Earth. And he's talking about all the elements of the Earth. He's talking about the wind, water, fire, the weather, the trees, the vegetation, the plants, the minerals, gold, silver, oil, natural gas. I mean, what if there's a natural gas leak? You can command it. It's part of the earth. It's the elements. And God gave us authority to rule the earth, the elements, the vegetation, and then he names all the animals. That's where man's original authority was to rule over, be king, is what you can say. It's like being king of all the earth, be king of all the animals, be king over the wind, the water, the fire, the elements, the trees, the vegetation. We come in the New Testament and we see the ministry of Jesus. Jesus stood up in the boat on the sea of Galilee and he rebuked the wind and the waves. The disciples said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They were ignorant of Genesis 126. And of course, with fallen man, they were not redeemed and didn't know about that authority. Jesus came to reinstate our authority and to demonstrate our authority. Jesus came to reinstate our authority over the earth and to demonstrate it so that we could do what he did. And when he commanded the wind and the waves to be still, we have the same authority. I've shared with you before um, a, a, a experience. I was in a boat in South Pacific, Vanuatu Island, and going from the littler island to the bigger island, and a hurricane was passing by on the outside of the islands, but we were getting strong wind, strong rain, and strong waves. And I was at the point, um, we actually had to walk, we usually take this small boat from our school, that's where the Bible school was, but the pastor said, I, I can't navigate these waves in our boat. So we walked across the island to the other side of the island in the rain, in the mud, everything, downpouring, sopping wet, and um, then on the other side, it was cl a narrower channel between the two islands. And there's a family that lives there, and they had a boat. And so we asked them if they would take us across the channel in their boat. And so there was probably about six of us, I don't remember, in this smallish, you know, motorboat. And we are starting to go across the channel at the narrow spot. And it's still, I don't know how far it is, but it takes a little bit, 15 minutes at least at regular full speed to get across. And we got out in the middle of the channel and a big wave came up and took our boat and we got to where we were almost capsizing. We were almost capsizing. We were being carried like this. And suddenly I realized we were in danger. <laughs> I was literally, I was just having fun. I mean, one like girl is holding onto my arm in fear and I'm like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> Riding the cross in these waves. And then all of a sudden our boat tips over, I mean, tips up on its side practically. And we're, getting carried by the wave like that. And I realized we were in danger. We could go a little farther and capsize in the middle. And out of my spirit, I don't recall what I said. It wasn't from my mind. It was out of my spirit. And I command, in the name of Jesus, I command the, this wave to go down or something of that kind. Instantly, the boat went flat. Instantly. Instantly. And the big wave stopped, and we just rocked the rest of the way. Now, we had gotten carried way off course. We were way up island and had to come back down because that wave had carried us so far off course. But it instantly put our boat flat to the point everybody in the boat was big-eyed. 
Like, did you just see what happened? (laughs) And it was all at the command, and the waves were stilled. The waves were stilled with a command in the name of Jesus. We have authority. We must know our authority. If we don't, we are in danger of being victims. It is authority to rule over the earth, over the animals, over the elements, and we'll get to over the wicked, over weapons. It is our authority that keeps us from being victims. And so many Christians have been victims millions of Christians throughout history having no revelation of authority and something bad happens and they're a victim and they die. They lose everything. And they don't know that they can command in Jesus' name and change the situation. And not knowing your authority and then not using it is what causes people to be victims. You don't have to be a victim You can come out alive and unscathed without the smell of smoke when you know your authority. And, and you know, it's so sad how Christians will stand beside, and even preachers who don't know any better, will stand beside a person who died and say, why, God, did you let this happen? Why did you take them? God didn't take them. God didn't let it happen. It was lack of knowledge. It was lack of exercising authority and becoming a victim instead of a victor ruling over their situations. And um, the Lord, uh, when I was in the mission trip this last week, I began one night, Sunday night, the message was about purpose, walking in your divine purpose. The Lord took me totally off what I thought. I didn't even follow my outline. I started out with the scriptures, you have purpose. But the Lord turned it around into using it for what can hinder you from fulfilling your purpose. One of the things that the Lord brought out, again, was dying prematurely as a victim of your circumstances. The devil wants to abort your life and your purpose so you don't reach the end. Long life is God's will for everybody. We read those scriptures on the radio broadcast about healing. Long life, at least, well, God says 120, 80 should be the minimum. You should shoot for the stars. Anything less than that, and especially short, of finishing what you have in your heart to do. There's two things, what God calls you to do and what you want to do. There's purpose, God's plan, what God calls you to do, assignment, finish that. And then there's also what you want to do. If you have a vision and a dream to go to Paris and then you're not ready to die until you get a trip to Paris. You have to fulfill those dreams as well that you have in your heart, you know, walking with God. So don't let Satan abort your life. Well, we're going to get to this also, but what about weapons? What about violence? You can be still, still be delivered from violence from terrorism and I'm going to explain I'm thinking so many things I'm jumping way ahead in my thoughts about how and what to do and I'm going to get there in a minute but I had the idea and I was sharing this with them in the conference um, about not dying prematurely and I love I've studied this I've thought about this I've meditated on this Jesus when he was on the cross he said it is finished He did not die until his work was finished. And what is his work? It was his earthly work. He still had to go to hell and finish that for three days and three nights. But his work on earth was finished. His purpose on earth was finished. But he had opportunities to die before that. They, in Nazareth, he went to his hometown and they wanted to throw him off the cliff. 
they were taking him to the cliff and it says in one of the gospels he just walked uh, between them and walked away he walked away from death it would have been premature death it would have aborted his purpose Satan wanted to kill him before he could get to the cross so that he wouldn't be a sacrifice as he was supposed to be and abort his purpose. They couldn't kill him in Nazareth. The Pharisees picked up stones to stone him. And if they had gone through with their plan, they would have stoned him to death and that would have aborted his purpose. But he also had the wisdom and the anointing to walk away from that alive. And he got to the end to fulfill his purpose, which was the cross. And then say, it is finished. And he did not let anyone kill him until he finished. And the same with Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says through a big chunk of that chapter, he says he was shipwrecked three times, spent a night and a day in the open sea. He'd been beaten with rods. He had been flogged the 39 lashes lashes again and again. He was in danger from Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from beasts all the time. Faced starvation and hunger. And he said, I like this. He said he faced death again and again. You should look that up. Second Corinthians chapter 10. He faced death again and again and he walked away the challenging question then do you know how to face death and live most people don't most Christians don't do you know how to face death and live I know that some of you are looking that up so let's go ahead and look up I'll give you the exact verse 2 Corinthians 10 and Verse uh, 23. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked harder. I've been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. I think another translation says faced death again and again. And then he goes on verse after verse explaining different ways he faced death. And he faced death again and again. And this is the Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, 11. I'm in the wrong chapter. I was going by memory, but I was wrong. 11, 23. 11. And you can read 23 through 28. 11, Second Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. And um, so, yeah, thank you. So in verse 23, he faced death. And this is what we're talking about. My, my message tonight is talking about walking in divine protection. Walking in divine protection. And this is how you live long. This is how you come to the end. Not only do you have to get healed from any sickness that comes along the way, but you also have to be protected from all the danger along the way. Anything that could kill you prematurely before you reach the end anything that would come to abort your life and your purpose and so Paul knew how to face death again and again and live well he knew his authority he knew his authority and in 2nd Timothy he writes to Timothy and says I finished the race so he lived till he was finished and we need to also finish our race don't die before you're finished and then we know um, from church history it's recorded the apostle John had been boiled in oil by the emperor I believe it was Emperor Nero who was persecuting Christians and killing Christians some of them he threw to the lions some of them he crucified on crosses hung upside down they, it's, it's written that John, the apostle, the beloved John, um, they had a big pot of boiling oil and put him in it and expected him to boil like chicken and the meat come off the bones and everything. And he was like 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Just perfectly fine. Hi there, Emperor Nero. <laughs> they couldn't kill him. They had to pull him out of the oil. And because they couldn't kill him, they sent him to the island of Patmos. They said, okay, put him out there on the Isle of Patmos, where he had the revelation, the book of Revelation. So they couldn't kill him. He knew his authority. He had to in order to face that and live and finish and live long. Now, what about the others that were killed? Let me, I, let me mention this quickly. Well, what about martyrs? I do believe that there are people who are called to be martyrs. I believe that because God uses their life as a seed. In John 14, Jesus compares himself to a seed. Let's go over there. John 14. No, I'm wrong. It's chapter 12, verse 24. John 12, 24. And he's talking about his death and his glorification in the previous verse. And then in verse 24, he says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, only one. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, he had just mentioned his own death and glorification. He's talking about his own life when he talks about the seed dying. And he says, unless it dies, it remains only a single seed. If he did not die on the cross, then he would have remained the only begotten son of God forever. One and only begotten son of God. But he turned his life into a seed so that God could have many sons. Hebrews chapter 2, I think it's around verse 10, says he's bringing many sons to glory. One son died as a seed. The harvest is many sons, millions of us. We are the harvest. We are the harvest of Jesus, death, his life as a seed sown. And so we are the harvest and he is bringing many sons to glory. So now there are many sons of God. But if he did not die, he would have remained the only son of God. And for that reason, that's why I do believe that there are other people called to be martyrs. They are called to sow their life as a seed. Why? For many sons to be born from their seed of their life. And so I do believe that. I do believe in martyrs. That is a high calling. There is a special reward you read about in the book of Revelation for martyrs. There's a special place for martyrs in heaven. It's a high honor. But I also believe that not everybody who dies as a Christian was supposed to die. I believe that a lot of Christians die because they don't know their authority. They don't know how to take their authority in the name of Jesus in a situation of violence where a gun is put to their head. You probably have heard it. I've heard plenty of testimonies of literally a gun put to the head, but the man or the woman knew their authority in the name of Jesus. They bind that gun and it cannot fire. And the person putting the gun to their head tried to pull the trigger and they couldn't. They pointed it somewhere else and fired and it went off. Then they came back again and put it to their head and tried to fire and it wouldn't go off. They tried it. They put the gun to their head, tried to pull the trigger, it wouldn't fire. They point away and fire and it goes. And then they put it back to the head and it won't go. I've heard that testimony more than once. People who know their authority and who know the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to get to this also, the blood. I remember hearing a story of a woman who had gone into a bank. Christian woman, her pastor had been teaching on the power of the blood speaking the blood gone into a bank and there was a bank robbery a man came into the bank with a gun 
told everybody to get on the floor. This was some years ago, but our lifetime, I believe. And told everybody to get on the floor. And he went from one to the other to the other, put the gun to the head and pulled the trigger. Pulled the trigger. Pulled the trigger. Came up to this woman, full of the word, full of faith and full of the blood. She looked up at him and said, the blood of Jesus is against you. And he tried, I can't pull, it, it won't go off. I can't kill you. I can't kill you. He gave up and he went on and killed the others. And she survived. The authority can stop a gun. The authority in the name of Jesus can stop a gun. It can stop a fire. It can stop wind. It can stop hurricanes. Or it can stop the hurricane from coming to you. As we talked about in the Authority of the Believers series, you might not be able to change a whole weather storm. But you can change its direction from coming to you. You can command it to go elsewhere. And, and you're not responsible for everybody else's home. Everybody's responsible for their own home. You can plead the blood of Jesus over your house and your neighborhood. We all always pray over our neighborhood because even if it misses our house and gets our neighbors, it affects the economy of the whole neighborhood. You know, so we pray over our neighborhood, covering it in the blood. And um, we rebuke bad weather from coming into our neighborhood. And so we need to be using our authority. We don't need to be victims. And I do believe that a lot of people who did die shouldn't have. If they had known their authority, they could have come out alive. But it's lack of knowledge. God said in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. And so um, I've given you um, a list of scriptures for promises for protection. And pull it out right now. And let's just read a few of these. This is a double-sided page, but there are so many more scriptures that I didn't even put on here because I wanted to leave it to one sheet of paper. <laughs> I could have gone on to three or four pages, but I cut it to two. But l this is just scripture after scripture of protection. You need to be speaking these promises over your life and family. Let's let me read to you. Let's start with uh, Job chapter five, verses 20 to 22 and verse 24 in famine. He will ransom you from death. So you're delivered from death in battle from the stroke of the sword battles. Now, right there, the stroke of the sword sword was how they used to fight today. It would be any modern military weapon. And I can say, having read testimonies of people who know the word and their authority, and particularly Psalm 91 as a protection psalm, on the battlefield in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Vietnam, with gunfire all around them, they are delivered from bullets, bombs, attacks because of their authority. It has happened. It is modern day deliverance that we are seeing with soldiers on the battlefield, knowing their authority, walking away from all kinds of danger in battle from the stroke of the sword. You will be protected from the lash of the tongue. So the tongue can't hurt you either. Need not, you need not fear when destruction comes destruction of any kind. It could be weather. It could be fire whatever you will laugh at destruction and famine. Okay. Famine brings death and you need not fear the beasts of the earth. You don't need to fear the snake, the scorpion, whatever else it's there. The lion, the tiger, the mountain lion, the cougar verse 24. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. That's protection from thieves. That is very thorough. It's a lot of kind of protection there. Bacteria is a beast. That's true. Bacteria in um, Psalm 91, what's the word? Pestilence. Pestilence refers to bacteria and germs and deadly diseases. Okay. Psalm 4, verse 8. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. Psalm 18. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. 
um, I am saved from my enemies. Let's skip down to uh, Psalm 32, 7. You are my hiding place. You'll protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Skip down to Psalm 55, 18. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me. There's warfare again. And then Psalm 91, the whole chapter, we won't read it right now. Um, Psalm 68, 20. Let's look at that. Psalm 68, 20. Our God is a God who saves from the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. And let's skip down to Isaiah. Uh, no, Psalm. Where are we? Proverbs 12, 21. Proverbs 12, 21. No harm befalls the righteous. No harm befalls the righteous. Skip to. Uh, well, Isaiah 43 is passing through the waters, passing through the rivers, walking through the fire. You'll not be burned. You'll not uh, be hurt. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon. That right there directly re reveals weapons. No weapon forged against you will prevail. So you can take authority over every gun, every terrorist attack. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is their vindication from me. And then uh, Luke ten nineteen. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Say nothing will harm me. Will Say it again. Will Say it again. Hallelujah. The King James says nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then Luke 21, 18, not a hair of your head will perish. And John 10, 17 and 18. I love this scripture. The reason my father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. Now understand this. No one takes it from me. You need to know your authority, when we talk about the concentric circles of authority, and we talked about you are the center circle, you have 100% authority over you. No one has more authority over you than you, even God. That's why you have to surrender your life to God. God doesn't force everybody to be saved. The Bible says it's God's will for all men to be saved. But he doesn't force anybody to get saved. He doesn't force you to obey him. You have the choice to obey or disobey. And so because of your free will and free choice given to every human being, you have 100% authority over you. You have to yield yourself to God. You have to say yes to God. You have to obey God for him to be Lord of your life and giving him control. So... You have authority over you. No one has more authority over you than you. You have a free will. You have free choice. And Jesus said, no one takes it. Talking about my life, my life. No one takes my life from me. No one takes my life from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. Now understand this. In, in your own Bible. You'll need to look this up. And underline it. I have what? Authority. authority. Everybody say it. I have. Authority. Say it again. Authority. Say it one more time. Have you have authority. I have authority. To lay it down. And what? Authority. authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Jesus is our example. You have the same authority over you that he had over himself. Jesus said, I have authority over my life to lay it down and take it up. No one takes it from me. Now you have to know this and have it in your thinking, in your awareness, in your consciousness. Anytime you face danger, no one's going to take my life. I have authority over my life. I am not going to die. You cannot kill me. The fire cannot kill me. The storm cannot kill me. The waves cannot kill me. 
I have authority over my life. And if I have to walk on the water like Jesus did, I'll get out of this. Walk through the crowd like Jesus did when they were going to throw him over the cliff. I'm going to get out of this alive, unharmed. There's another scripture I don't even have here. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me. Do you know the reference? Look it up. I don't need to do your homework. Look it up. He ransoms me unharmed. You can be unharmed. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Coming out of the fire with not even the smell of smoke. We can. We need to know it. We need to believe it. We need to speak it. That's the way we do it. Know it. Believe it. Speak it. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me. You can walk away unharmed from anything. You speak it before you get there. You speak it it every day. You speak it regularly, regularly, regularly. You speak it every day because when you get there, you you might not have a moment to say something very much except Jesus. (laughs) might be all the time you've got Jesus and boom and he can deliver you but you've already declared you are delivered and protected you've already set your covenant of protection in action you've already believed it and spoken it so it's already working amen hallelujah praise the Lord so there are many promises for protection and there's more like I said I even cut these down to two pages and look these up mark them in your Bible and again I'll point out to you I strongly encourage you to do like I have done I encourage you to love the Word of God I love the word and years ago this bible is now 27 years old recovered already way back when i first got it i started marking bibles uh marking scriptures i mean in my bible in color i do not recommend highlighters because they tend to bleed through the paper for one and another they only come in three or four colors and you can get Colored pencils in a rainbow of colors. You never run out of colors when you get colored pencils. So colored pencils don't bleed through. And there's many, many, many colors. I started marking promises by topic 27 years ago when I got my Bible. And I color them uh, by topic of promises, uh, what kind of promises they are. For example, my healing promises, scriptures, healing scripture promises, I colored in green. To me, it's life. And so I color them in green. I color protection promises in red. It's a symbol of the blood. So I colored the protection promises in red. I colored promises for wisdom, guidance, and direction. I mean, I'm always asking God for wisdom, guidance, and direction. I color those scripture promises in orange. Um, Promises for finances and provision. I color in pink, etc. And so you can make up those that you want to color in your own Bible. But I strongly encourage you to do that because then even as you're reading through your Bible, you can um, look and I don't know if you can see this very well, but like on this page here, I've got red scriptures, purple scriptures, green scriptures, and you can thumb through your Bible and at a glance, see the healing scriptures at a glance, see the protection scriptures. And so they're pink scriptures, purple scriptures, and at a glance, scriptures will stand out to you. And when you need, I need healing right now, then I go through looking for the green. You know, I need wisdom right now. I go through looking for the orange. And every time before I go on a mission trip, I always study protection. I always study protection and I go through red scriptures. And so I encourage you to mark your scriptures. You need to have it in your heart. You have to have it established. Know it, believe it, and say it before you come to the danger. So then it's already in action for you. Hallelujah. Your faith has already been working on it. 
Glory to God. So how do you walk in divine protection from God? And we're talking about protection from fire, protection from storms, protection from violence, protection from terrorism, protection from guns, whatever. Number one, dwell in the secret place of the Most High. That's Psalm 91, 1. He who dwells in the secret place. And the key there, dwelling, is living there, abiding there daily. It's relationship. It's relationship. Dwelling in his secret place. It's, it's relationship with God. It's to live, abide, and remain continually in him. In Christ, knowing that you are in Christ continually everywhere you go, walking down the street, driving, wherever you go, I'm in Christ. I'm in him. I'm hidden in him. And speaking of the word hidden, when I went into the communist country to preach and literally was followed by the police one day following me to see where I was going and the pastor picking me up, we were on the motorcycle. Can you picture me on a motorcycle? <laughs> I've been on the motorcycle so many times, of course, always wearing pants, but I mean, in the rain, in the heat, I mean, you try to go to church looking nice and you have to ride on a motorcycle in the rain, you get there all dripping wet. <laughs> and so anyway, yeah, I've been on the motorcycle so many times, Philippines, Vietnam, India, Africa, so many times that's the mode of transportation. And so, and you know that, don't you? <laughs> Very popular over there. Well, I was in Southeast Asia, communist country. And before I went into the country for the first time, even before I left home, I had scriptures from my partners to pray. I found scriptures called, about written hidden, hidden in Christ, because I knew I didn't want the police to see me. They shouldn't see me. They shouldn't find me. I'm preaching illegally in the underground church. So I found scripture promises about being hidden, hidden in Christ, hidden. I don't know. There were several scriptures and I pass them out to my partners. You pray these scriptures for me when I go there. I'm hidden when I'm in there. And he protected. Even that time that the police followed, uh, we were on the motorcycle. The pastor was uh, driving and I was sitting behind him. And he said, we can't go to the meeting, to the church, because the police is following us right there. He's watching you when I came out of the hotel. And so we had to pretend like you're a tourist. So we drove around to shops, and I got off the bike and went in looking in the shops like I was a tourist. And I guess I looked enough like a tourist. After a couple shops, that police officer left. And then I went and preached. <laughs> and went to the church and preached. But I'm saying I went there with scripture, hidden in Christ. I was going to be hidden in the shelter of the Most High. And I would, you know, that the enemy wouldn't see. So number one, dwell in the secret place. Number two, make him your protector. And what I mean by make him, the same way you make him your savior, you confess him as your protector. And a lot of Christians don't know this, that you really need to make him everything to you by confession on purpose, on faith. That's why to a lot of people, he's not a healer. They don't believe in healing is from God. They believe God puts sickness on you to teach you a lesson. And you never know if you're going to be healed or not. You might die and it might be God's will. Well, they don't know he is healer and they never call him healer and confess him. You are my healer. So you have to make him your healer. And I confess you just as I confess you as my savior. I confess you as my healer. Well, I also confess you as my provider, people who are looking to themselves and scraping every penny. And how are we going to pay the bill? They're making themselves the provider. But I call the Lord, you are my provider. And as a single person, I call you my husband, providing all my needs. And now we're talking about call him your protector. You are my protector, my deliverer, my shield. I look to you, I entrust my life to you, and I make you my protector. If you don't 
do that. It, it's part of releasing your faith. It's activating the covenant of protection or the promises of protection. You have to believe them. You have to say them and you have to look to him and declare him. You are my protector, my deliverer. My... Hallelujah. My shield. And, and that comes from Psalm 91 verse two. You know, Psalm 91, one, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Do you know what verse two is? Verse two says, I will what? Say of the Lord. Everybody say, I will say of the Lord. Say it again. I will say of the Lord. What? He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So notice, I have to say of the Lord. He's my refuge, my fortress my protector. And there's other scriptures like Psalm 18, two and three. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. He is my shield. So you have to call him my protector. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my shield. So just like you call him savior, as you call him provider, as you call him healer, you also call him a shield, deliverer, protector, refuge, etc. And Psalm 91 verses nine and 10 says, if you make the most high your dwelling, then no harm will befall you. You have to make him your dwelling, make him your shield by calling him. And then number three, meditate on the promises that we've been reading for protection to build your faith. Meditate, have them in your heart. Believe them, build faith. Four, confess them. Speak the scriptures concerning your protection every day. So that's know it, believe it, and speak it. Meditate. Build your faith. And then number four, confess the scripture promises about your protection every day. Number five, then receive the covenant of protection by taking communion. And to abbreviate that, actually, that's something I do before I go on a mission trip. Usually always the night before I leave home, I take out the juice and the bread and my Bible and I read protection scriptures. And I say, Lord, I'm going out and I'm going to come back in and you are going to deliver me. You are going to protect me. Psalm 121, I like that. He watches over my coming and going both now and forevermore. My going out and my coming in. I'm going and I'm going to be protected as I go. I'm going to be protected in the air, on the ground, on the water, by ship, by plane, by train, by car, wherever I am. I'm going to be protected and I'm going to come back home safely to this place. And I will give you praise when I return safely. And then I drink the juice and eat the bread and establish that in covenant. Covenant. The bread and the juice. So take communion over. And you, you, we've talked about this before in the blood covenant teaching. We talked about it in the tithing lesson last week, uh, last month, where Melchizedek brought Abraham the bread and the wine, covenant of provision, covenant of healing. You establish your life, a relationship with God on the covenant. You need to do it regularly and for each aspect. And depending on what you are at that moment in need of, if one day you need healing, take communion and establish again as a reminder. And that this came out to me as a strong, the Lord brought it to my attention in the conference this last week, the word remembrance. That's all about covenant. Covenant is all about remembrance. And when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he's not saying just think about the thorns and think about the, the crown of thorns and the spear in my side and the whipping beating that I got and everybody just thinking, Oh Jesus, you suffered so terribly. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm such a bad sinner and forgive me. That's not, I mean, that's just Okay, you know that. Get over it. All right. The thing you have to remember is what was accomplished. It was covenant. What was the purpose? It was covenant. And the word remembrance is a covenant word. 
The word remembrance is a covenant word. And I loved it. I, I um, found this last week in Isaiah, and I won't turn there right now, but God says, I will remember no more your sins. But the next verse says in the King James, it's better. It says, put me in remembrance, state your case. So he's saying, okay, I'm not going to remember your sins. What do you want me to remember? Let me show you that real quick. In Isaiah and the King James translation. Um, where is that scripture? Do you remember? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, no. Uh, 43. 43. Isaiah 43, verses 25 and 26. Isaiah 43, 25 and 26. And I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. I will not remember. This is all covenant. Remember is a covenant word. And so by covenant, God has selective forgetfulness. He will choose to forget your sins. And then read this next verse in the King James translation, verse 26. Somebody have King James? Read it. Put me in remembrance. Remind me of your merits. Let us plead and argue together. Set forth your case that you may be justified. Okay. Set forth your case. Maybe it was the new King James said, state your case. Put me in remembrance. State your case. So what's that? Take to him the promises. Take to him the covenant of healing, covenant of provision, covenant of protection, and it's all covenant. So it's in the blood and the body of Jesus. So that's why you take the communion. This is covenant talk. And when you need something, if it's a moment of healing you need, then you say, okay, God, blood, body, Jesus, I'm putting you in remembrance. You don't remember my sins. That's where people get hung up. God, I'm so unworthy. I really don't deserve for you to heal me. I really don't deserve you to meet my need and protect me. I've been so bad. Forget it. God did. But what do you remind him of? Remind him of his covenant promises. He said, I will provide for you. I will heal you. I will protect you. I will deliver you. So then you take the scriptures. Your word says by your stripes I'm healed. Your word says you meet all my needs according to your riches and glory. And it's sealed in blood. And we put him in remembrance. We state our case. He says, I'll remember what you want me to remember. What is it you need right now? State your case. And bring the promises to him. Bring the promises, whatever it is, if it's a healing, if it's finances, if it's protection. God, I'm putting you in remembrance right now. You're my provider. You're my protector. You're my deliverer. I'm going out right now by faith. I'm going to the mission field. You're going to protect me going out. You're going to protect me coming in. I'm reminding you of what you said. And it's in your blood and in your body. And then I take the communion. That is so, so Powerful. I mean, this is a, the blood. The devil can't cross the blood. And this communion is covenant relationship. And you're putting God in remembrance. That's why we have to, that put me in remembrance is all about remember the covenant. Remember the covenant. Remember you have a covenant with God Almighty. He swore oaths in blood to you. And you keep that, you remember that covenant and God keeps the covenant. Hallelujah. So receive the covenant by taking communion over the scripture promises for protection. And then number six, know your angels are working for you. And there are several scriptures that we've talked about angels, Hebrews 114, for example, and then Psalm 34, seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Psalm 91, 11 and 12, he will command his angels to guard you in all your ways. 
And so there are other scriptures there. Matthew 26, 53. Uh, he will put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. That was for deliverance. Acts chapter 5, the angel of the Lord opened the doors and brought Peter and uh, who was it with him? in uh, Acts 5, brought them out of jail. The, or was that Peter? That was Peter. And then Acts 12. Well, actually, Acts 12 is Peter. Maybe they both were. Anyway, I don't have it right here. But the angel of the Lord getting them out of prison. All right, so that's number six. Know your angels are working for you and release faith. Confess the scripture promises. Say, Father God, I know you command your angels concerning me. So we command the angels to go before me, behind me, be my rear guard, go in front of me, lift me up so I don't strike my foot on a stone. No harm will come near me. The angels encamp around me. And so you speak the, uh, con confess the scriptures. And then number seven, plead the blood or apply the blood of Jesus over your life, your family and your property every day. And we've talked about applying the blood before, but the picture is in Exodus 12 when the Passover lamb was killed and the death angel was going through Egypt to kill all the firstborn in the land. God said, kill the Passover lamb apply the blood to the door frames of the home and that the death angel will pass over the the devil the death angel the curse can never enter through the blood so we apply the blood how do you do that with words by speaking you say lord in the name of jesus i apply the blood of jesus over my life i apply the blood over my family my spouse my children my grandchildren i apply the blood around my property and you can do this by walking around your property or you can just speak it we draw a bloodline around the border of our property right now in jesus name and no evil can cross that bloodline in jesus name when you get in your car your vehicle apply the blood over your vehicle i apply the blood of jesus from the top to the bottom side to side front to back and over every working part in my vehicle in Jesus name this vehicle will bump nothing and nothing will bump my vehicle in Jesus name and apply the blood over your vehicle apply the blood when you go on the road when you're on the freeway whatever apply the blood daily by confession as you go out the door in the morning as a matter of fact we make this a, a, a practice in our family in the name as people go out the door say bye you're blessed and covered in the blood that's what we say every time people go out the door. Bye, you're blessed, covered in the blood. We bless each other as they go out and we cover each other in the blood as we go out. So you should make that your also farewell to your family out the door. Bye, you're blessed and covered in the blood. Now, if you live alone, you cover yourself. I go out the door. I'm blessed going out, blessed coming in. I'm covered in the blood. No weapon formed against me shall prevail. You speak that applying the blood of Jesus over yourself and um, we don't have time to go into more detail on that and then number eight be obedient to following the leading of the Holy Spirit this is critical a lot of accidents happen because of being in the wrong place at the wrong time every accident being in the wrong place at the wrong time if you know a devastation has occurred. If you had not been there, you wouldn't have been hurt. And I am confident that the Holy Spirit is always warning us when we're not supposed to be in a place. And I thought like, well, what about why were we there? Well, we weren't hurt, but we were close enough to see that fire so we would know what needed to be done. If we had been half a mile back, we wouldn't have seen, wouldn't know what's going on. We were close enough to see it. We were there for a purpose to, to command that fire to stop. But if anybody's hurt, you weren't supposed to be in that place. And that comes from not following the Holy Spirit. I am convinced the Holy Spirit is always warning us with checks. Don't go there. Don't go that way. Take another route. And this is a series I have on the MP3, How to Be Led by the Holy Spirit. You need to learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Learn the checks of the Holy Spirit, the witness or the warning of the Spirit in you. Don't go that way. Go another way. Stop. Wait. Go now. Because in those leadings is the way God will protect you most of the time. And you look at a lot of the protection in the Bible. It is because God directed a person. Go here. Go there. And they were protected. And think about how God delivered baby Jesus from, from uh, King Herod. 
God told Joseph, get up and go to Egypt and get out of there. And he was protected. God didn't come down swooping with a thousand angels and an army around Jesus to protect him. No, he said, go to Egypt, get out of here. And a lot of times it's get out of here. It's stay or go. It's wait. It's go a different way. And as you follow the Holy Spirit, that is the main way God protects us. Or one of the main ways. Anyway, one of the biggest ways is simply by leading by direction. And so you need to go back to that teaching. I have it on MP3 about how to be led by the Holy Spirit, because you cannot ignore the Holy Spirit promptings and be protected if you're out of his will. And so if you're in the wrong place and you're ignoring the promptings and a lot, and much, most of the time it's not recognizing the prompting. I remember hearing, um, I could tell you story after story, and I did on the series, How to Be Led by the Holy Spirit for Protection. People who just got an unction, and they moved a certain way, and they were delivered from an accident. It, it, it just, or a person who got in an accident, and I always wondered, why, God, did you let it happen? Years later, he learned about the leading of the Spirit, and he realized, oh, the Holy Spirit told me not to go. And I went. And now I know why that accident happened. Yeah, I had a feeling that I shouldn't go, but I felt like, oh, we need to go and get things done. Don't be in too much of a hurry. Don't feel like you've got priorities. If you've got a a sense on the inside, don't go, then don't go. It doesn't matter what other important things you've got if it means your life. So follow the witness of the Spirit. It is hugely important because you cannot violate the witness, ignore it, And go the other way, be disobedient, and remain protected. Hallelujah. So, and then speak the word, speak the blood. When you face situation, just like we talked about, we look at it, we point our finger out, in the name of Jesus, we command that to stop. We command the wind to stop. We command the fire to stop. We command the storm, go another direction. Use your authority. Use your authority when you see danger. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father God, we thank you for the anointing of the spirit. We thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation teaching us. We can be delivered from all harm. You said in your word, you ransom us unharmed from the battle waged against us. And you said no harm will befall us. You made a covenant with us of protection. And we declared at night, we enter covenant with you. We call you our shield. We call you our refuge. We call you our deliverer, our protector. And you ransom us unharmed from the battles against us. And we also commit to follow your spirit, to become sensitive to your spirit and the leadings of the spirit. So we're in the right place at the right time to get the blessing. And we are not in the wrong place at the wrong time. Father, we thank you and we look to you. We give you praise and thanks for being everything to us. You are our God in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.